Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present part five of my series on the selected gross pathology of the cat. We're going to talk about the skin. Skin is a great example why I call these lectures the selected gross pathology. The lecture is not desired to be encyclopedic, but simply to illustrate some important diseases and show some wonderful pictures of lesions of the skin of cats. Before I do that, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who over the years have provided such wonderful images which allow me to put these lectures together. Let's start with some viral diseases of the skin of cats. This unfortunate individual is infected probably in multiple systems with feline herpes virus type 1, usually known as a cause of acute and chronic rhinitis. In kittens, especially in shelter conditions, some animals can have infection in other organ systems, including the eye, where it will affect the cornea, and in the skin. Usually these lesions are seen on the face. The animals may have a history of chronic upper respiratory infection, and if you look carefully, you may actually see herpes viral inclusions in the skin. One giveaway on this particular disease is that it causes a very eosinophilic dermatitis. So your main rule out in most of these cases is going to be eosinophilic granuloma, which we'll talk about shortly. Another possibility and another disease we'll look at in a minute is mosquito bite hypersensitivity. This can be a tough one to diagnose. Um, most of the time the inclusions are seen at the edge of the ulcerated areas in cells which are breaking up and sloughing off. They're not always present, or at least they're not always present in the biopsies that we get. Immunohistochemistry is a great adjunct in this particular case. PCR can be questionable because we all have a lot of herpes viruses, every species does, and you may accidentally pick up herpes virus. Feline herpes virus type 1. Another viral infection that causes respiratory infections but occasionally will mutate to become a very pathogenic form in which it attacks the skin is a virulent systemic feline calici virus identified by Dr. Patty Pesavento probably about 15 years ago in shelter cats and it still pops up mostly on the west coast. Whereas the traditional Khaleesi virus may cause mouth ulcers and uh, upper and lower respiratory infections, this particular uh, virus um, has a much higher mortality rate, up to 60% in some cases. The skin lesions um, start out as blisters and then ultimately may slough because this particular virus is endotheliotropic. It also hits the pancreas as well. In outbreaks, adults are more likely to have severe disease than kittens, and about 20% of cats may show only mild or no clinical signs, but still be shedding the virus, which can be uh, shed up to 16 weeks after clinical recovery. So this is a very dangerous virus because of inapparent shedding in some of the animals and high mortality in the rest. Moving on to bacterial diseases, sort of pseudobacterial diseases. Um, here is a disease that's occasionally seen in young cats, um, but you can see it in any ages, and uh, it affects the chin and lips. This is feline acne. Often you'll see that the chin is very swollen, and when you shave and clean it up, you will see these large comedones, which are bacterial infected on a secondary basis. Um, they will rupture, they will become furuncles, and then you'll have inflammation in the surrounding tissue, and this, this area will become very uh, swollen and very sore. A similar syndrome uh, you can see in young short-haired dogs at all. You know, acne is sort of a, a disease that's seen in puberty in humans to a certain extent in uh, dogs, but not so much in cats because any age can be uh, can be affected. Uh, various allergies can 
also exacerbate this particular condition. Well, here's an angry looking cat with a very crusty face. Remember I said a lot of skin lesions, hyperkeratotic is what you're gonna go to. The skin grossly doesn't have a large repertoire. So words that end up being used over and over are, are hyperkeratotic, alopecic, and ulcerated. So there are a couple of possibilities here. Um, this animal looks like it's been scratching. It's very angry. Uh, the lesions are often uh, seen first around the uh, face and over the ears. And while this could be Sarcoptes, because any species or any mammalian species over 300 last count have been identified with Sarcoptic mange, this is a Sarcoptid mite, but it's a little different. This is Notoedris cat eye. It's a very peritic uh, uh, arthropod. Which is highly contagious. Um, actually, this usually starts around the the uh, head and the pinna and the neck, and then you'll often see a patch around right over the tail head, and that's because these animals in the infection, as cats will do, they will lay with their head curled up with their head on their bottom, and so that's not an uncommon sight to see it. This also causes disease in mongoose in Hawaii. That was a vet path paper probably about three or four years ago. Um, so no edris cat eye, that's a good one. Sarcoptes, scabii, I can't say this isn't. Um, Otodectes cynatus is the ear mite of dogs and cats and ferrets. It's not really peritic. Those animals tend to get a large buildup of dark black wax in which you'll find the adults and nymphs and eggs. So probably wouldn't be able to give you credit for that one. Because this is a dermatitis, you will see peripheral eosinophilia. You will see a lot of eosinophils in and around the skin. In some cases, those are bad enough that you might even see a regional lymphadenopathy um, with a large number of eosinophils percolating through the lymph nodes. So nodal edries, cat eye. Well, here's another hyperkeratotic lesion. And this one we see significant alopecia, some crusting, and this is what you would expect to see in some cats with dermatophytosis or ringworm. In cats, the offending organism is almost always microsporum canis. This infection is usually much worse in kittens, and then uh, signs will diminish as the cat gets older. So the older the cat, the more subtle the lesions. It usually starts on the face. Don't forget that tail head lesion too. And uh, it could be pustular, or it could be uh, papular, or you might not see it until at this more chronic stage. One of the sort of giveaways from my practical experience is that uh, people in the family also have uh, little round lesions as well. Um, Persians are predisposed. Siamese and Himalayans will get uh, often will get very silent infections where you don't see any lesions at all, but you'll see them in members of the family. And don't forget, if this particular agent becomes inoculated traumatically, then it will form a pseudomycetoma, and it can grow underneath the skin, forming a large, oozing, fistulous lesion that needs to be surgically removed. When dealing with dermatophytes, you can certainly pick them up on a biopsy. Culture is probably more sensitive than biopsy, except in those cases of, of pseudomycetomas where they are inoculated and growing underneath the skin that's healed over the top. Dimorphic fungi can be a problem in cats. They're susceptible to all of them, but one that has a particular affinity for the face and the nose is Cryptococcus neoformans. Your two big rule outs for big ugly lesions of the nose would be this and squamous cell carcinoma. We'll look at that in a minute. Um, a lot of times these animals are immunosuppressed. 
um, but there is a variant of Cryptococcus neoformans variant GADI that can infect immunocompetent animals. Uh, your rule outs for this particular lesion, boy, there are a lot of them. Some we've already talked about. Uh, Khaleesi virus, I think that that would be a good rule out here. A number of, fun of uh, dermatophytes, pseudomycetoma, um, herpes virus, quite a few. So this is a tough one to look at. But if the lesion was restricted to the nose, I gotta always consider cryptococcus. And cryptococcus will go up through the nose, the animals will get a rhinitis, and then it will pass through the cribriform plate, um, causing a cerebral infection. So uh, kittens or cats and horses seem to have the uh, prevalence of cryptococcal uh, meningitis and encephalitis through that route. Uh, just another uh, dimorphic fungus that I have to mention because it is very prevalent in certain parts of the world, including certain parts of Brazil, is Sporothrix shankii. Sporothrix um, is usually inoculated into the skin. It may be inoculated during cat fights. And uh, these infected cats, one of the problems that was seen a number of years ago in urban areas, in uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil was that the cats would get into uh, flower boxes and they would they would get in there and they'd poop or they would do whatever but they would uh, shed some of these sporothrix while they were in there and the people that were gardening would accidentally poke themselves and be infected with sporothrix so flower box sporothricosis was a and probably still is a real problem um, Usually these are nodular, not quite so ulcerative. Um, the animals often have a higher degree of host immunity that prevents spread, um, but it's a very difficult thing to eradicate. Um, these cats can also not auto-inoculate themselves during grooming. Now the books say that uh, if you see sh cigar-shaped uh, yeast, that that is a good sign for sporothrix. Now, Sporothrix is the same size as histoplasma. You often see multiple ones of them within uh, macrophages. And one thing I've learned over the years, histoplasma is not always round, as they say. Sporothrix is not always cigar-shaped, as they say. So uh, culture or PCR is the best way to differentiate between these two agents. So little uh, little dots and macrophages and a nodule from cat skin time to go get some pcr or some immuno to make sure we're on the right track now as we move out of the infectious agents we'll come to a uh, entity that we have talked about once before in the gi system and this is the eosinophilic granuloma complex this is a complex of three relatively distinct entities. One we talked about before, the indolent or rodent ulcer, which often appears on the lips or in the oral cavity. The other two appear on the skin. Um, this is these large red angry almost wheels um, are the true eosinophilic plaque. It's called a plaque. It's raised. Um, they coalesce. And this is the one that is the easiest to demonstrate eosinophils in just about any age lesion. Um, they're angry, the cats lick at them. Because you get a lot of eosinophils, it's going to be pruritic. And these can be seen all over the cat. Another variant of the eosinophilic granuloma complex is often seen on the back part of the legs, especially the hind legs. And this is the linear granuloma. This one is a mix of eosinophils and macrophages. So the, the number of macrophages in there, granulomous inflammation, will sort of dilute the number of eosinophils, but you can usually find it. But these are very characteristic. Once again, the cats lick them, they're pruritic, but um, they're on the back of the legs. And I've had a number of cats with this, some that would uh, recrudesce, so the animal had to be immunosuppressed for a while. And, and um, my, one of my current cats right now has some very small ones that she plays with every once in a while, but haven't required any specific treatment. 
in my experience, and this is only my experience and largely practice experience, these cats do well with dietary modification. You take them off the traditional uh, chicken-based diets that so many cats are on and put them on something a little more exotic. And they do quite well, and uh, it might be able to get these animals off drugs. So that's a practice tip. Don't take one that one to the bank, and certainly don't mention it to the dermatologists in your department. Oh, here's a great lesion, and we're looking at the paw. Um, here's here's the uh, uh, claw, the first claw. We have the digital pads here, and this is the carpal or the tarsal pad. And this pad is sort of blown up. It's soft. It's a little bit deflated. Um, like a flat tire. These are non-painful lesions. So one of the characteristics of this condition, which is known as plasma cell pododermatitis. Nobody's changed that name. I'm expecting them to any day. But one of the characteristics is you see on these swollen soft pads, this, these cracks like the fine patina of China, of China a, a nice China plate. Um, or maybe a statue, and they're very characteristic. Okay, so plasma cell pododermatitis is just what the name says. If you biopsy this, you're going to see tremendous number of plasma cells. You might even see lesions in the animal associated with this proliferation of plasma cells, including hypergammaglobulinemia um, and glomerulonephritis. Even amyloidosis has been identified in a number of these cases, but you know when you get that many plasma cells, they're going to be producing antibodies, and it's going to run your gamma globulin levels up. Um, the, they're softer than normal because the underlying fat pad has sort of collapsed, um, probably as a result of the influx of plasma cells. And uh, in some studies, 50% of these animals are positive for feline uh, lentivirus but uh, I don't think that that's a hard and fast rule. So plasma cell pododermatitis, it can be also seen in concert with the plasmacytic stomatitis that we talked about in lecture number three on the GI system. Can we go back to an ulcerated nose? Sure we can, because cats get a lot of them. You see this. Um, one of the things that you want to think about is the condition in this cat that does not look happy is mosquito bite hypersensitivity. Um, mosquito bites due to allergens in the saliva will cause a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction on the, uh, the nose, the very thinly skinned areas on the animal's face, including the uh, back of the ears. You can see them in the periocular areas or around the foot pads. And this is a, a deep mixed dermatitis with some eosinophils in it. And here's a picture of this on the ear of a cat. You know, this is uh, most of the pictures that I've seen of mosquito bite hypersensitivity, because we have to think about a couple of other things. We got to think about uh, feline herpes virus. We've got to think about um, cryptococcus, squamous cell carcinoma in a light skinned animal, anything that affects the nose. Um, these are generally the more mild of the lesions, and the cats always look pissed off. You know, with the other lesions, the cats have been through a lot more. They just have this sort of resigned, sort of, and uh, just do whatever you want, look to it. But these cats are like, I've been bitten by mosquitoes, I'm pissed off. I know that's not much of a diagnostic, but they seem always in these pictures a lot more alert than uh, we see with some of these other more severe chronic diseases. Here's a great picture. Um, this one is very mild. This is a, the skin is torn here, and this is a condition known as feline skin fragility syndrome. Um, cats do get cutaneous asthenia or dermatosporaxis as well, but it's extremely rare. Uh, not that this is common, but I think the cases of this are a bit more common. It's often associated with hyperadrenocorticism. and a couple of cases have been associated with uh, uh, feline infectious peritonitis, and the skin gets very thin, and it tears, and you get these gigantic tears like this. So rather than call it dermatosporaxis, um, which is a congenital thing, this is feline skin fragility syndrome. Great picture here by Sam Jennings. And uh, this is an acquired condition, whereas uh, 
Ehlers Danlos congenital asthenia, dermatosporaxis, whatever you want to call it, is a congenital thing that they have since birth. But you can usually find evidence of other diseases going on in the animals with feline skin fragility. And when we're talking about excessive corticosteroids, um, one of the things, very interesting, um, there's a great picture by Dr. Moriello, um, is a condition that is seen in cats that are given a lot of steroids. And uh, I guess the, the collagen gets weak in the ears and the tips of the ears will fold down. Um, ear folding due to usually these animals are getting a lot of steroids, exogenous steroids. So it can be an a iatrogenic issue. I think it's sort of cute, but uh, you don't want to be responsible for something like that. There's certainly a market for uh, uh, cats with ears that flop down, but uh, there's already a breed known as a Scottish Fold. So those are those flop down at birth. We don't have to wait and inject the cat with a lot of steroids to get the desired effect. Okay, um, here's one that uh, there isn't a whole lot known. It's called feline ulcerative dermatitis syndrome. It often appears along the back or up on the neck. Uh, let me show you another picture of this one. Here's a good one that is up on the neck, and we're not exactly sure what causes it. When you see something like this, you think, well, maybe it's psychogenic alopecia. The cat just licks and licks and licks. And I'm no behavioralist, and I don't have any great pictures of that one. This is one where the cat can't get at. There's it's in an area where a lot of people give injections, so could it be a hypersensitivity reaction? Um, there's not a lot of inflammation in these lesions. You will see a linear pattern of fibrosis across the bottom of the biopsy. It's a little suggestive of a uh, previous vasculitis in that area, but it's usually over the neck between the shoulder blades. Psychogenic alopecia is usually bilateral, and it goes down over the flanks where the animals can get to. This is sort of a, a plump-looking cat, and I don't think that it could turn its head around to get to that particular spot. So feline ulcerative dermatitis syndrome, uh, neck and up over the shoulders. Another condition that I uh, uh, really don't know quite what causes it yet is uh, a condition seen in kittens and they get this characteristic very black crust and under the microscope it's thick and it's black and it's a huge crust and this is known as proliferative and necrotizing otitis externa of kittens. Um, these lesions, uh, the epidermis is infiltrated by numerous T cells, largely CD3 positive, and it appears to be re the result of uh, apoptosis by these T cells of the keratinocytes in multiple layers. It's easily treated with immunosuppression. Um, so a lot of times I think that these are, are very characteristics that are recognized by the dermatologists and the animals is a tree with tacrolimus and they clear up. So we often don't get biopsies. Before we get into the neoplasms of the skin, I'll hit one paraneoplastic uh, condition, and we have talked about this before. There are a couple of, of cutaneous perineoplastic conditions. There's a hyperkeratotic one, which we looked at in lecture two, um, that is associated with thymoma. This is a second one, and notice I've mentioned this before in the the, the uh, uh, hepatobiliary lecture, but cats with pancreatic uh, liver, which could be hepatocellular or biliary condition, will get a very characteristic uh, perineoplastic uh, lesion of the skin where the, the hair just falls out and the skin is thin and very shiny. Uh, doesn't look at all like the one that uh, it results from uh, thymoma. It usually affects uh, the, the abdomen, chest, and legs. And if you got to look at the paw pads on this one, they're often uh, crusty and cracked and this animal probably has significant pancreatic or hepatobiliary disease as well. Okay, we're looking at the most common neoplasm of cat skin, and we're going to look at that, and everybody's going to say, oh, it's a melanoma because it's black. No, it is not a melanoma. This is a, a 
condition that goes by a couple of names. I learned it as the cystic and pigmented basal cell tumor. I certainly do that. It's been referred to as the solid and cystic apocrine ductular carcinoma, thinking that's a low-grade carcinoma. has not been my experience. Some people just go ahead like the dog and call them um, cystic and pigmented trichoblastoma. They are, uh, they are neoplasms of the hair germ. Some are extremely pigmented and not very cystic. Some are very cystic and not very pigmented. But uh, black lesions is a skin of cat. We don't, you know, just automatically jump to uh, melanoma. Melanomas are fairly uncommon in the skin of cats, and these are extremely common. So solid or cystic and pigmented basal cell tumor, that's what I call them. Uh, very, very common neoplasm of the skin of white cats that may arise in the, the periauricular area, as we see here, or around the nose is squamous cell carcinoma. There's been some wonderful papers in vet paths over the years, um, and you can read all that you want, but it's something that when you see ulcerative lesions like this in the uh, nasal planum of the cat, that's got to be one of your top rule outs also always want to think about the possibility of uh, cryptococcus as well and uh, mosquito bite disease at least if you're in an area um, during the summertime where mosquitoes are in high prevalence i want a more tragic uh, neoplasms to rise in the last 30 years is vaccine associated sarcomas and whereas they uh, only occur in one out of every five to 10,000 vaccinated animals. These are very aggressive tumors. Um, they pop up at site of vaccination. And I'll say, I've will said this before, I will say it again in these lectures. A cat is unique in that it takes just a mild antigenic stimulus and it goes crazy and turns it into a malignancy. We see that in a number of systems and this is the one that we see in the skin. Just a simple vaccination and Ultimately, it develops one of a range of malignancies, everything from fibrosarcomas, which are the most common, I think, because they're so poorly differentiated, people tend to lump them into fibrosarcomas, but lyomyosarcomas and peripheral nerve seed tumors and even lymphomas have been identified at the site of vaccination. And the problem is um, when you go ahead and remove um, the neoplasm, if you vaccinate the animal. For a while, people are vaccinating the animal the tail tip um, because the tail, if something happens, you can cut that off. Okay. Um, or you vaccinate the leg, and if it develops something like that, you would remove the leg. But the problem is that oftentimes um, these neoplasms will recur at the stump. Um, they tend to metastasize um, on a fairly wide basis, and you can see them in multiple organs, very aggressive neoplasms. And uh, I know we track them a lot better than we do, but I still see several a year, and it's just unfortunate. Okay, here is an absolutely fantastic picture of a condition that was identified by uh, Mike Goldschmidt and the other great pathologists up at the University of Pennsylvania probably about 20 years ago. And I always think that and they always look alike. These cats have this severe abdominal bruising that looks like they've been run over by a car. And not only do they have bruising, but there is leakage of serum. This is a condition that is known as feline ventral abdominal lymphangiosarcoma. And it's an infiltrative malignancy of lymphatic endothelium. And they form these clefts, it's sort of like hemangiosarcoma, but there's no blood in them. And they leak fluid, and, and these animals make terrible uh, house pets because uh, even before you shave they have all this fluid on the bottom and then the first thing they want to do when you bring your nice white bedspread home is jump up on that and make a mess. So uh, uh, hopefully you have some good markers for lymphatic endothelium uh, like protoplanin and live one that will help you distinguish because it can be very difficult to distinguish truly um, hemangiosarcomas from lymphangiosarcomas. So ventral, feline ventral abdominal lymphangiosarcoma, I've seen people refer to as angiosarcoma, sort of sidestep the whole blood vessel versus lymphatic problem, but uh, it is a disease of lymphatics. And then finally, I'm going to uh, finish with uh, 
one of my favorite neoplasms that we see in the cat. And this is one that arises from tendon sheaths. And you can see this storiform pattern. This used to be called the giant cell tumor of soft parts. Now, I think most people just call it anaplastic sarcoma with giant cells. Um, it often arises from the tendon sheaths. And it's very interesting, both uh, gross and, and microscopic patterning of the cells. And the classic storiform patterns. And, and you'll see these large multinucleate cells with up to 60 nuclei. And... That one is sort of fun. You can see it in the dog. You can see it in the cat. Grossly, you know, you could also say this was a fibrosarcoma. That wouldn't be a problem. And don't forget, we're going to look at this. I think when we get to respiratory, where I've thrown in a couple of tumors. But uh, the digits of cats, they often will throw carcinomas, especially of the lung, which will cause enlargement of the, of the digit because it's down around the in the bones. And this is a little further back. So giant cell tumor of soft parts. Okay, well, it was a brief run. I hope I hit some of your favorites. And, uh, you know, next time around, we'll probably have some extra uh, slides and some extra cutaneous lesions and cats to talk about. I hope you enjoyed uh, the last 30 minutes, and I hope that you're going to come back on a regular basis to the Foundation's YouTube channel or the JPC's video library and, uh, and look up more on diseases of cats, diseases of the skin, because there's a whole series of lectures on that, and maybe some diseases of other species or systems as well. Hey, with that, as always, I'm going to wish you a wonderful day and fantastic health.